Design your own life. With Dima Satya Lismana. Subscribe, tekan tombol bell, share dan like videonya ya guys. Terima kasih. Almost universally, ancient texts and traditions, they've told us that everything and everyone is connected through this mysterious web or net of energy. Very well-known scientists were influenced by this revolution and the thinking that there is a field of energy that underlies our existence. At that time, it was called the ether. It influenced scientists like Nikola Tesla, Rudolf Steiner, Royal Rife. But the idea of the ether It's been around even long before the 1800s. In the 1600s, the father of science, Isaac Newton, he described a field of energy that he called the ether, and he used that word to describe the substance that he believed filled the universe and was even responsible for gravity and the sensations in the human body. Einstein, he believed in this field as well, but he's described it in a very, very different way. He said simply, space without ether is unthinkable. So the point that I'm making with all of this is the sense in the scientific community that there's something out there that fills what we think of as empty space. It has been accepted for a very, very long time until recently. But now, science has reached a plateau. In order to explain the phenomena that are being seen on the quantum level, in order to explain the phenomena that are being seen on the other side of the universe relative to where we are now. Science must accept a deeper connection. The 1986 experiment demonstrated that the field that can no longer be called the ether, it exists and it exists precisely within the parameters that Michelson and Morley had predicted 99 years earlier. Now that we know this field is out there and begin answering the deeper questions, what is it made of? How does it work? How do we relate to this field? What does it mean in our everyday lives? Well, the attempt to answer these questions has led to the largest research project ever conceived in 5,000 years of human history. It has led to the greatest level of scientific cooperation, global cooperation, using the largest and the single most complex and sophisticated device ever built by humankind. So what is the fundamental purpose of CERN? The purpose is to solve the fundamental mysteries of the universe and in doing so, answer the deep questions such as what is it that fills the empty space? CERN is trying to determine what happened in the first fractions of fractions of seconds right after the Big Bang, after the instant of creation, to determine what is matter actually made of? What is the field that we're talking about made of? So bottom line of, of what's happening here is that inside of the particle accelerators, there are two tubes. And in one tube, quantum particles, generally protons, are accelerated in one direction until they reach just under the speed of light. And in the second tube, another set of particles are being accelerated in the opposite direction until they reach just under the speed of light. And there is a very specific point then where these particles are allowed, they're directed to come together and collide with one another. This is the particle collision that we're talking about. And when that happens, the quantum particles are destroyed in and of themselves and broken into fragments of their constituents And these fragments, these smaller particles, create very specific traces, very specific patterns that can be mapped, and they have characteristic qualities that scientists know. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is a typical map from the resulting collision of quantum particles. And each of those paths that you see is tracing a path and a quality and a characteristic of uh, of an even smaller constituent of the particles. So in this way, the scientists are beginning to understand the elementary particles, the stuff that goes into making up the matter as we know it in the world today. When I was in school, 
back in the 1950s, 1960s, early 70s. I was taught that the atom looks like what you're seeing on the screen right now. It was things moving around the thing, particles called electrons that are moving around the, the nucleus. And this is the model that has gotten science so far. However, it is also the model that's breaking down because we now know that the atom doesn't look like this. The atom is not things moving around things. And this model of, of the electron, the proton, and the neutron, as well as it served us, technically, we know it is no longer true. The atom is made of fields of energy, pulsing, vibrating fields of energy that are concentrated in some places more than others. But this new model, this vibratory model of the atom, has given way to the particles and the subparticles now that are so complex and so numerous, they're actually called the particle zoo. Well, the particle zoo now has gone far beyond electrons, protons, and neutrons. They're telling us now the new standard model that all matter is made of leptons, bosons, and what are called hadrons. Under the category of leptons, this is where we find our familiar electron as well as, as other particles. Under the category of bosons is where we now find photons. And under the category of hadrons is where we now find things like the protons and the neutrons, as well as quarks and a lot of other things. This is a very, very different physics that has unfolded as a result of what has been discovered at CERN and other laboratories as we look into these fundamental particles. Now, all of this is going somewhere because everything that we're learning about this physics must be occurring within the conduit of stuff. There's something out there that is allowing all these interactions to happen. And this is, this is where we're going with this, this whole thing right now. So when we look at what is now called the standard model of physics, you're seeing it on your screen, what you see is that there's some particles that are related to matter, some particles are related to force, and some are theoretical, such as the Higgs particle. And you're seeing it in a gray box. It's got a circle around it. The Higgs particle, if the standard model is accurate, if it works the way we think it really works, then we should be able to find under certain conditions this Higgs particle. And if that particle is there, it's going to open the door to even deeper questions, but it's going to give us a lot of answers at the same time. The question that the physicists are asking, is there an ultimate particle? Now we've gone from the atom, as we used to think of it, now to this particle zoo. Is there an ultimate particle? Is there what is called a God particle? This is the term some physicists are actually using now. Is there a God particle? That is the fundamental particle for all things. CERN is recreating the Big Bang to answer this question. It's not so much about the Big Bang itself, that primal release of energy, it's what happened just fractions of fractions of fractions of a second after that release happened. As the universe began to expand, something began to change. And certain particles that were created in that release did things that cannot be accounted for right now. Some of the particles slowed down, some of them continued moving at the same speed. And signs are saying, why? Why would some particles slow and some particles continue at the same speed. Why would some particles begin to have mass and other particles not have mass? Well, the current theory is this, that there's an unrecognized field of energy that was responsible for those changes. And that field has been known uh, as the Higgs field in honor of the creator of the theory, his physicist named Peter Higgs. On July 4th of the year 2012, Science at CERN made an announcement that absolutely rocked the scientific community. They announced that through one of the CERN experiments, they had discovered a new particle, and it was in the mass region precisely where that Higgs particle was predicted to be by the standard model. They'd never seen it before. So they said, if the standard model is, is working, and we collide these particles and they break down into their elementary constituent particles in the area of a certain energy level, we should see something. That energy level is 126 giga electron volts. They'd never looked there before. 
And when they made this discovery, it is now called the Higgs boson, the Higgs particle. So the properties of this Higgs boson are precisely consistent from where Peter Higgs had predicted. Well, this is important, and this is where it gets really, really interesting, because for the Higgs boson to exist, there must be a Higgs field that it is emerging from. The Higgs field is the elusive field that we're gonna be talking about. The Higgs field has now been validated. The Higgs field is believed to be the field that scientists have been searching for for three centuries now, since the time of Isaac Newton. The ether that fills the empty space, it's now accepted that this Higgs field is the field that exists everywhere, all the time. It's what gives particles their mass. So at the time of the Big Bang, just after that primal release of energy, when those particles were created, they began to expand, it is moving, because they're moving through the Higgs field, that some of the particles interacted with the field in a way that slowed them down and gave them mass, while others continued to move at the speed that they were originally. This is, in the scientific world, this is a blockbuster discovery. This is a landmark discovery, because this field that has been questioned, the speculation has been, does it exist? Is it there? We now know that it is, and it's given many names. Some people simply call this the Higgs field. Some people call it the field. Some are calling it the source. Some are calling it the matrix, as Max Planck. Some are calling this the divine matrix. And for the rest of this program, just to make it easy for our conversation, I'm going to use either the term the matrix or the divine matrix to describe the field that we're talking about now. So the question is, now we know that the field is there. This matrix is there. What does it do? How does it work? Well, this field fulfills three fundamental principles that make your life possible, my life possible, and the world as we know it possible. Number one, the field is the container for all things. All things that we know, all things that exist in the universe are happening within the confines of this field, of the divine matrix. Number two, it is the bridge between our inner and our outer world. It is the bridge that explains how our thoughts, feelings, emotions, our prayers can be created from within us, but find the people and the places that are the object of our prayers, whether in another room or halfway around the world. It's the bridge. And number three, this field is the mirror. It's a quantum mirror in our world for what we truly believe in our mind and in our heart and what we create in our imagination. So when we ask the question now, who are we? Our answer must incorporate our relationship to this field, to the divine matrix. I've spent much of my adult life exploring many of the ancient indigenous traditions of our past. And my exploration has taken me into some of the most magnificent and beautiful and remote and isolated and pristine places remaining in the world today, such as the monasteries of Tibet that were very available to me in the 1990s. And it was in one of these monasteries that I had the opportunity to meet with the elder, the abbot of the monastery. And it was while I was writing the book titled The Divine Matrix. And I asked this abbot from his perspective as a Buddhist scientist, as a Buddhist scholar, I asked him, what is the stuff that fills the field of everything? What is the stuff that holds this universe together? What is the force that allows everything to be as it is in the world today? And answered my question with a single word. And the word was compassion. So the answer to my question, what is the stuff that fills the universe? What is the stuff that holds everything together? The abbot had just answered me with the word compassion. And I looked back at him and I said, is compassion a force that fills the universe? Is it the stuff that holds everything together? Or is compassion an experience that we have within our bodies? And then they looked at me with a single word for the answer, and the answer was simply yes. That compassion is both a force that fills the universe and holds this world together, and it is an experience that we create within our bodies. Now, I'm sharing this with you 
because on the, on the cold, damp floor of a monastery almost 16,000 feet above sea level on the Tibetan plateau, this beautiful, powerful, brilliant Buddhist man had just shared with me one of the deepest secrets of the human experience that we have within us the ability to interact with the force that fills the empty space of the universe. And that interaction and that force is the focus of their lifetime of study. So when I asked him about the role of compassion in our lives, what he was saying to me is that because this field is a mirror for everything that we create within us, we create compassion in the world by becoming compassion in our lives. The field is reflecting what it is that we become. In other words, we must become in our lives the things that we choose to experience in the world around us. So the rules that govern Planck's field, the rules that govern the Higgs field, the rules that govern this field that the abbot is describing for me, those rules tell us why the abbot was absolutely correct when he said to me that we must become in our lives the things that we choose to experience in the world. Both the discovery of the Higgs field and the wisdom of the Tibetan abbot tell us that not only are we connected through a field of energy, but we are the field. We are the matrix, and it's because we're the matrix that the discoveries that describe it are describing us as well.